Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be back in Atlanta, my hometown. Uh, I am uh, honored to be um, reading between these two ladies. Um, it's over an amateur between two pros, really. <laughs> That's a lie, right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm always amazed when I come back to Atlanta at the unbridled growth of this city. It doesn't even, it's not even slowed down by a drought. And um, uh, I'm also amazed at the growth of the Georgia Tech campus. It's just so incredible. Um, see Wade Mitchell back there. Gosh, yeah, I can, you know. <laughs> it's amazing it was just a little thing. Um, and I'm also amazed at the growth of Poetry Tech. I mean, when I went here, we didn't, we didn't have electives. We didn't have, uh, you know, we didn't have poetry, that's for sure. <laughs> we had a class that uh, a guy named Jim Young taught in Yates and Wallace Stevens. And Wallace Stevens was a businessman that got my attention. I guess it started me. Uh, but anyway, we, well, I want to thank Tom for really making this program work. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I, I uh, did one of my favorite things in New York City when I have to stay in town on Friday night. They, the Metropolitan Museum is open late. And um, I was wandering through um, the Egyptian section there. And uh, I remembered this is the first, what inspired me to write, uh, write a poem, which was the first poem I ever got published, which is also difficult to do because you've got to send in all these points and stuff. But anyway, um, what it is is a, yeah, the Metropolitan Museum in the 1920s sent an expedition and they found a tomb of a fellow named Makutra who was uh, an official or the, like the head exchequer of uh, the Pharaoh Metotep. And uh, what's amazing, everything they know about him, but what was found in the tomb were little boxes of you know, his farm that represented his farm and his dairy and the slaughterhouse and the granary and the, the garden and everything that he would take with him uh, in the afterlife. And uh, so it sort of reminds us how life never changes. I think, you know, the only thing that's really different is we've got cell phones and maybe more distractions. But anyway, this is how things never change. In a hieroglyphed wooden box, stiff miniature men wearing white kilts and sandals sit, tending tiny, exquisitely carved black and white cows, just like the Holsteins along the Housatonic at the Shady Maple Farm, manned by my mustache neighbor John and his suspended crew, who know all about cows and slog galosh through mud and mature, manure, spreading its abundance on their fields. They work on unending chores for their cows, somehow making ends meet until the day that they, die, they drop. Like their ancient brothers who tended Methotep's herds by the Nile, 4,000 years ago, they traveled together an eternal memory Ka from the Middle Kingdom. Now what I forgot to explain is that Ka is not cow. That's uh, in the Egyptian uh, mythology. Ka is the part of the soul that goes in between the land of the living and the land of the dead. Uh, the other part of the soul is the Ba. And, you, and the Ba is what we conventionally think of as the soul that goes into the afterlife. Um, I, I want to read one other poem that um, I thought of this is for uh, the grandson of this farmer John who is my neighbor who really takes care of things for a place that I have in Salisbury, Connecticut on a the farm there and this little boy I'm now married to a lady who's a cancer surgeon and if you don't get it all out you're in bad trouble and this little boy I, had, uh, I got to know for a couple of years and he had an inoperable cancer and this, this is, uh, it was in a book that I actually, Kurt, uh, Laurent's husband helped me put together called Quartet for Daniel. It's for this little boy. 
This is Quartet 4. It's called Preparing for the Next Life. I am surprised when Daniel's mom calls me eager for me to take him to the tractor store. Uh, the tumor has grown. And I, I guess I'm going to stop here and explain a little more. Uh, this little boy, um, his dream was to start his own lawn service uh, company. And uh, this is one of the last things that he wished for. He also wanted to be a senator. This is a remarkable, really remarkable kid, and it's a real tragedy. So I'm going to start all over. I'm sorry. We're su I'm surprised when Daniel's mom calls, eager to take me to take him to the tractor store. His tumor has grown. He can't eat or talk easily, so he has to write his words down. When I get to the cabin, Daniel greets me with his jacket on slurring. There's not much time left. He wants to be sure everything's in stock for his spring landscaping business. I alert the store manager. We arrive. Daniel climbs on one of the 50 tractors after surveying the display lot. The manager says he's picked the exact one I would recommend for the job and extols its virtues as Daniel motions for the paper to list the accessories that are needed. We ask the manager to price this up. Inside, Daniel on a mission pulling equipment off display racks, stacking the rototiller, chainsaw, weed whacker, leaf blower outside the manager's office. He knows exactly what he needs. We sit in front of the manager's desk, me not knowing me not quite sure why I am there, and Daniel with his contorted face looking like Elephant Man, calm and businesslike, reviewing the tally, his blue plaid hunter's cap askew. Being November, we take the leaf blower, but Daniel's now too weak to give it a crank. When I take him home, he barely manages the stairs. Hospice nurse, Ask us where we've been. Daniel grins, gives me a handshake and a hug. The next night he's gone. <laughs>